I'm Dave Kazarowski, instructor and content developer for the CFA curriculum at the Princeton Review. I have a CFA charter as well as an MBA in investment management. I'm currently a professor of finance in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've also worked as a sell-side equity research analyst and as a portfolio manager in a family office. For the Princeton Review, my areas of expertise include portfolio management and equity analysis, as well as alternative investments, fixed income, and derivatives. The CFA ethics curriculum is probably the most important topic of the exams. It accounts for 15 to 20 percent of level one, 10 to 15 percent of levels two and three. So quite a bit of the exam. What's more, the exam has what's called an ethics adjustment, meaning a candidate that scores close to the pass fail line on the exam can be pushed over it or under it. Uh, based just on that student's score on ethics. So with this, as with all subjects, there's no substitute for knowing the material. However, in this video, I'll take you through five tips for approaching the ethics material and making this very important subject, hopefully a, a little bit easier for you to understand. So let's dive right in. So tip number one, don't automatically go for the most severe response to an ethical violation. You might be tempted to think that the Institute wants you to be strong on punishment of violations. Well, that is somewhat true. There is such a thing as too much, and that too much answer can often serve as a wrong answer trap on the exam. Let's take an example question to illustrate what I mean. This is a practice question that I took from uh, the Princeton Review's uh, CFA prep drill questions. Joseph Cohan, CFA, is an investment banker. Recently, he ran a valuation of a company for a divestiture deal. After he finished his report, the broker revised it without notifying Cohan and used the new version for the deal. After the deal closed, Cohan found that the new version ignored some information resulting in a materially lower valuation. Which of the following should Cohan most likely do according to the CFA Institute Code of Ethics and Standards of Professional Conduct? A, dissociate from the firm immediately. B, report the issue to his supervisor or C, publish a report using his original analysis? The correct answer is B, report it to his supervisor. This question describes a suspected violation, not necessarily a clear violation. The most severe response would be to walk away from the deal and quit the company that allowed it to happen. The CFA Code of Standards is not that harsh. The first step in a case like this would be to find out if there really was a violation or if it was just a mistake. Then we can think about more drastic action. In this case, Cohen would only dissociate from the report or from the company if he found there was a violation and his company didn't do anything to correct it. Moving on to tip number two. Use the examples and the practice questions as educational material as much as you do the text itself. In the other sections, you can pretty much get what you need from the reading, and the drill questions are more about hammering home the material rather than introducing new material. That's not the case in ethics. You can read the Code of Standards thoroughly and still not get enough detail to answer all the questions. Only after doing the questions themselves can we see how the Institute wants to present this information and how best to respond to it in all cases. Again, let's take a look at an example of this from my colleagues at the Princeton Review. Carrie Sifter, CFA, is an investment analyst at a firm that encourages his employees to do volunteer work, and Sifter volunteers at a local senior center. In gratitude for her service, the senior center gives her free parking near her office. Prior to accepting the free parking, according to the standards on additional compensation arrangements, Stifter should most likely a. Disclose the details of her volunteer position to her employer and obtain written permission from the firm. B. Not report the free perks to her employer because she is conducting activities as a volunteer, which is not in conflict with her employer's business activities. Or C. Inform all her current clients about her volunteer activities and the free perks she receives. The correct answer is B. She doesn't have to report anything since the volunteer work doesn't conflict with her day job. 
The CFA curriculum states that the member or candidate must get written consent from all parties to accept gifts that might reasonably create conflict of interest. Just to read that rule, the idea of conflicts of interest is just kind of left hanging out there. Not until you get into the questions like these does the meaning really become clear. So pay attention to the questions in addition to the material. Tip number three, don't just jump the gun and automatically assume that the question you're reading has an ethical violation. First, determine if there is or is not a violation. Then, if there is one, what that violation is. Many of the questions have three answer choices, two of which state a violation, and the third say there's no violation at all. So it is up to you to decide. Let's take an example that illustrates this. Navani Quinones is a level two CFA candidate. She's nervous about taking the exam and decides to write some bond valuation formulas on the inside of her belt. During the exam, she's relieved to find that she does not need the formulas she's hidden in her belt. According to the CFA Code of Ethics and Standards of Professional Conduct, Quinones is A, in violation of both the Code and Standards 7A conduct as participants in the CFA I programs, B, not in violation of any code or standard since she did not reference or use the formulas in any way, or C, in violation of the code but not the standard 7A since she did not use the formulas. And the correct answer, of course, is A, yes, she did violate the code and the standard by taking the cheat sheet into the exam, even if she didn't use it. Now, the main thing that I'd like to highlight in this case is that before we even look at the answer choices, we can decide that a violation has occurred. Two of the answer choices give violations and one doesn't. So we can eliminate one of the three answer choices before we even read the three. Taking it the other way, if we conclude that there wasn't a violation, we can narrow it down to one answer and answer the question before even getting into the answer choices. Moving on to tip number four, be sure to keep the big picture in mind. This is especially true for the ethics portion. This exam throughout all subjects is all about detail. With some of the ethics questions, you can bypass the detail if you understand the overarching idea behind the standard. This is an advantage of this section over others because an underlying theme is a lot easier to remember than a mathematical formula for a single question. So let's have an example for this one. John Jay, CFA, is asked to recommend an investment management firm to members of his family. He screens a list of firms and drafts an email recommending four that have excellent track records. Before sending the email, he learns that one of the firms has been acquired by a larger firm that caters to ultra-high net worth individuals. While he believes his family members might not be treated as well at the larger firm, he's busy and decides to send the email without making the proper changes. Jay has most likely A, violated the standard regarding diligence and reasonable basis, B, violated the standard regarding fair dealing, and C, violated the standard regarding misconduct. The correct answer here is A, that he violated the diligence and reasonable basis. This question has a lot going on. I think for questions like this, the best strategy is to work backwards. In this situation, the analyst was lazy. If laziness had been a violation, then our job would be done. Of course, the answer choice is which one best fits the idea that the analyst didn't do enough. Again, looking at the big picture and fitting it into the question. Our choices are diligence and reasonable basis, fair dealing, and misconduct. We know that fair dealing is about being fair and objective, and that isn't the main issue here. Misconduct is mainly about being honest with your business partners, and that's not a fit for the question either. So diligence and reasonable basis is the best fit for this situation, keeping in mind what we know about that concept. Tip number five, I'm a little reluctant to bring this up because there is a potential to abuse it, and that is using common sense. There is such a thing as ethics intuition. You can develop an instinct if you stare at this stuff long enough as to what the right answer is for these questions. Think of what you consider fair or how you would want to be treated. 
that won't get you all the way here, but it is very useful. And keep in mind that the people who write the CFA exam might turn that into a trap as well. So don't overuse this. Let's take a look at what I mean by this. Graham Bishop, CFA, writes research on a company that has operations in a remote, undeveloped region. While on a research trip to its headquarters, Graham agrees to visit the remote operations by private helicopter and lodged at the staff headquarters near the site. Graham is unable to inform his employer about the arrangements with no telephone service or internet connection in this remote region. He decides to tell everything to his supervisor once he gets back to civilization. Graham has most likely a violated the standard regarding independence and objectivity by accepting the offers, b violated the standard regarding disclosure of conflicts by not telling his supervisor, or c not violated any standards of the code of ethics at all. This time the answer is c. There has not been a violation committed. If you just look at this question and apply common sense, under normal circumstances, Graham would have had to disclose before the fact that the company is paying for his transportation and lodging and might not have been able to accept it. But given the fact that he doesn't have phone or internet, he doesn't really have the chance to do it and shouldn't be held to account for it. In a special circumstance like this, Graham is not held responsible. This is not explicitly stated in the text uh, of the code and standards, but it's just common sense. It's the way people should be treated, and it's something that you should think about when you answer questions of this type. So to close this out, I'd like to reiterate what I said in the beginning of this video, and that is that there's no substitute for knowing the material. I wouldn't want to give you the impression that a few tips or tricks can provide a shortcut to passing the exam in ethics or in any section. There will always be heavy lifting, but in addition to studying, Understanding the structure of the exam and the underlying themes that are in it can give you a better chance of success.